Alison? Mm, not yet live on Facebook, so. Oh, okay. Hi, Alison, you can start the show. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And hello, welcome to the town hall. Uh, it's always a, a great pleasure joining all of you uh, on this platform. It's really exciting. And today we are at the 28th edition of the town hall, and we hope your weekend is going well. And I really just want to welcome you all on board. We have very engaging, a very engaging topic today, which is really gonna be very exciting. So we look forward to hearing your insights, hearing your thoughts on how, on what the existing challenges are and how these could be improved. But before we dive into the town hall topic for today, let's just do a recap of what our previous town hall uh, looked like. So in our 27th edition, um, we looked at sickle cell disease and all the challenges that people living with sickle cell disease face uh, within our country and out of the country. And we had the chance to uh, be, be enlightened by Dr. Muno uh, Foma Kene, who is the chairman of our town hall, who gave us a rundown of some of the physiology and pathophysiology involved with sickle cell disease. And we had uh, Ari Echi, who is a sickle cell advocate, who came to tell us about um, her challenges uh, living with sickle cell disease and what keeps her going and some of the ongoing projects that she's uh, championing. And we had Dr. Ferdinand Doom, who is a medical doctor living with sickle cell disease, who has had the chance to receive healthcare in both Cameroon and in Germany where he's currently based. And he gave us an overview of what the health systems um, look like in both countries with regards to the services they deliver for sickle cell uh, patients and how he has been successful in navigating existing challenges. Today, we're going to go on to another even exciting topic. But before we dive in deep, I want to check in with um, all my co-moderators and then to check in with the, uh, the, um, with the organizers uh, just to see if we have any updates with regards to COVID. So I will be co-moderating this session today with Louisa Viban, Elvis Dancy, and Brian Tungomo. Hi, Louisa. Hi, Alison. Sometimes I get so excited I start speaking without unmuting myself. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're calling from. Um, it's always exciting coming back to the town hall and commoderating with this uh, very wonderful team. Uh, I'm really excited about today, especially given that it's a follow up from where we ended last week. Um, if if you were there, or if even if you were not there, there was, as Alison has recapped, uh, the story of the situation of sickle cell in Cameroon. And listening to those who are living with sickle cell and those who are taking care of people with sickle cell, um, the topic of today was one of the concerns that they raised uh, in that town hall. So it's really going to be an exciting moment. And I really urge everyone to be interactive. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Louisa. Elvis, you want to say hello to our viewers? Hi, Alison. Hi, Louisa. It's always a pleasure to see you. Hi, Mono, and everyone in the town hall. It's such a great pleasure to be with you again. Um, today is going to really be interesting. I remember when we had a talk from uh, uh, one of our speakers last week, he said whenever he had a sickle cell crisis and he, the thought of was even more than the sickle cell uh, uh, itself because of the customer service and the way he was always treated in the hospital. And I think that alone triggered the subject matter for today, customer service in the healthcare sector in Cameroon. So I'm really excited and uh, um, I'm sure that it's going to really be an interesting session. So once again, it's a pleasure to, to be on board with you. Thank you, Elvis. Uh, Brian, you wanna say hello to our participants and our viewers? Hello to everyone. Always nice to be back. Uh, really excited about the topic for today. 
Um, really glad to be on this really wonderful panel with uh, Lisa Allison and uh, Elvis and Dr. Mono. Really thrilled to looking forward to an exciting session. Thanks, Brian. And we have Dr. Christelle Juego, who has been working together with um, other colleagues to ensure that we have our French televiewers being able to follow up in French. Hi, Christelle. Bonsoir, Alison. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Et c'est un honneur renouvelé de participer à toutes les émissions de Cameroon Town Hall. Merci encore. Merci beaucoup, Christelle. So we're going to hand over to our chairman, Dr. Muno, to give us updates that he has for us uh, for COVID. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Good. So today we'll be talking about a wonderful and uh, interesting topic, which is never really interesting for the patients who visit our healthcare system and how to make things better. We've been looking at COVID now for almost more than a year, and uh, we've had some good strife things from the beginning where we saw this disease. And uh, we've had lockdowns, we've had testing, we've had, uh, therapeutic developments, which have been very slow. We've also had social distancing, discussions on herd immunity, and also vaccination, which has been the key in order to let us get out of this pandemic. Now there is a threat about the Delta strain and see exactly if it's gonna work with vaccines. This is actually a timeline of uh, the biggest scientific uh, innovation, I think, when I think about something that is amazing is that we only saw the first COVID patient back in December of, uh, of 2019. So back in uh, just January of 2020. And right now we do have a vaccine that works. The efficacy of the vaccines vary from almost 95% uh, to about 80%, it's very efficacious and 100% uh, efficacious in preventing disease. This is a state of the disease in the world right now. We've had over 3 billion people have been vaccinated. So if anyone is still thinking this is like a try and error thing, it's not. If you're vaccinated 3 billion people, then you would see a lot of side effects and you get to see, understand better. So looking at uh, the different countries that have been highly impacted by COVID, we get to see that a lot of these countries are highly developed countries. And uh, this is actually a representation on the number of deaths per million population. So most of them are highly developed countries. Here we get to also see what is happening at the level of the pandemic in different countries based on how they are vaccinating themselves right now. And uh, based also on uh, the level of democracy and the level of strictness and how the government can implement any measure. So looking at the pandemic at the moment, we can see that at least Cameroon is getting out of uh, the bad days from the second wave back home, but our vaccination rates are pretty bad. And uh, here is just the global number of patients that are infected, we're almost getting to 200 million people being infected and almost had about 4 million deaths from COVID. So this is an extremely, extremely, extremely uh, devastating pandemic. So here we can see that based on what is happening now in the world, the UK is having a little rise despite their high vaccination rate. There are several questions that pop out is it the type of vaccine that was chosen? But we all know the AstraZeneca was given to about 70% of those who were vaccinated in the UK. And the Pfizer is the rest of uh, almost about 25%. Also, we do have uh, India that has actually treated, taken good care of itself during the pandemic. I know we're all scared. And the number of cases have almost reached that of the US right now. But the number of cases are actually trending down. So here you could see that in the past almost one month, the number of cases have just increased by about 2 million. Cameroon, on the other hand, is doing quite well at the moment. They had a huge second wave, which things have stabilized, but we need to learn from this uh, wave. 
We need to learn that protection is very important. We need to get access to vaccination and get to vaccinate our people. Here is just showing you the number of active cases in Cameroon as from yesterday, which I got from Wadometer. And uh, this shows you the cumulative number of deaths that have occurred in Cameroon over the time given. South Africa, on the other hand, in the past uh, two weeks, they are having new cases arising. And uh, there are a lot of questions about if it's the Delta uh, strain or what is happening there. And the level of vaccination also is still slow compared to other places in the world. The US, on the other hand, has had cases, but the number of cases have been pretty low from the time a month ago right up to now. They have had less than you know, 400,000 cases. Number of deaths also have been pretty, pretty, pretty low compared to the initial pandemic, peak of the pandemic. As I said before, we have had about 3.14 billion people have had this vaccine. And there is still a lot of uh, discrepancy between the wealthy and uh, the poor nations. And uh, the poor nations do not have access to the RNA vaccines. So they actually do have access to what the West can give them. So it's really a lot of um, uneven access to vaccination. So the wealthiest 27 countries in the world have access to almost a quarter of all the vaccine, which is, they are responsible for just 10% of the world, but they have had access to this number. So when will life return to normal? The good thing is that it's returned to normal in several places in the US, in Cameroon, life had always been normal. So you can see here that if we want to vaccinate everyone in Cameroon at a given rate at which we are vaccinating people, it's going to take us 10 years. So in 10 years, we could have all the pandemic, more and more pandemics and uh, in and out. So the European Union is doing quite well. I think in the next two months, they'll be able to vaccinate everybody and reach a target of 75%. And uh, are we burning the curve? Question is, we thought we're burning the curve in certain areas and we're getting to realize that the type of vaccination that was done really matters. And here is Israel, the number of cases were pretty low for a while. We've had some few rise in cases. We do know that the United Kingdom has started seeing some few cases that are rising due to the Delta variant. It's taken over the UK variant there. Here we see in the United States that the disease is slowing down in most places in New York City, where I am right now in the hospital, we hardly even have a COVID patient. And uh, it's unbelievable. You can see in the Shisels Island, we can see here that they are actually, they have been well vaccinated, but they are still having breakthrough cases. The question is, is it the kind of vaccine they received or what is happening at this level? They are the most vaccinated country in the world. And here you could see Chile also, high rates of vaccination and coverage, but still having some breakthrough cases. Now in the first 20 countries, you don't find any African country there based on the number of doses that have been given. Mainland China has actually given 1.26 billion doses. So there is this whole thing that someone is trying to kill people in Africa, then they will not vaccinate their nations as much as they're doing. We still do have the Pfizer, the Moderna, we've spoken about this vaccine, AstraZeneca. There is the Novavax, which had a clinical trial that just came out at New England Journal of Medicine. What is amazing about this is that it can be stored at any given temperature. It's cheaper, it's extremely efficacious. And uh, we do have the J&J, which is a one-time dose. We have the Ciano Pharma. We do have the other Cian, the, the Ciano um, Vax also, and other vaccines that are available. Here you could see that the efficacy of um, each and every uh, vaccine compared to the strains that we have, the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta, we do know that most of the strains are still efficacious when you give them vaccination. So it's quite important to still encourage people to vaccinate each other. A lot of them here have not been tested on the Delta strain, but we know that the Pfizer the mRNA vaccines are efficacious. Here you could see the name changing that occurred, the South African variant, the UK variant, Brazilian variant, Indian variant. A lot of countries got angry that were using their names in order to create variants. So WHO actually changed the names to Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. So here you could see that uh, 
the Delta variant is actually becoming a, an issue of concern. And uh, the number of cases are actually is replacing the Alpha variant in a lot of places, even here in the US. Here you can see the level of transmissibility to each of these vaccines, the original Wuhan strain, and now you can see the Delta strain is almost getting to where moms can be and also chicken pox. So here is just a chart for those who are interested, an updated chart to know exactly what is AstraZeneca and uh, what you need to know, what are the side effects, and also looking at Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, J&J, Cyanopharma, Novavax, which is a new vaccine. The FDA is going to review also this. The efficacy is very good. So here we're going to know there are going to be a lot of modalities that are available. Concerning treatment, not much has changed concerning treatment in the past days. All we know that the monoclonal antibodies do actually reduce mortality. That was a new thing that came out from the recovery and uh, the um, other trials just recently. We do know that therapeutics have not been the best in order to help us get out of this pandemic. Treating a, medic treating a, 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 a viral infection can be very complex. And uh, so far, prevention has been the key and vaccinating ourselves out of it and testing ourselves also out of it and making our community safe. So we do know back then, and now I think it's well confirmed that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work in any setting. We also do know that the use of uh, convalescent plasma can work, but it's very complex in order to do research and administer it. So there are some mixed studies concerning that. We do have a, an emergency use authorization for baricitinib and uh, remdesivir. We know interleukin-6 do work. Initially, we thought they were not working. Tocilizumab, they are extremely expensive. And uh, the good thing is a lot of countries are taking the COVID seriously, and uh, we're working ourselves really out of this uh, big global pandemic. The thing about it is back in 1918, everyone learned how important a mask was, but the pandemic hit us and everyone forgot about the lessons learned then. So we know that most of the supplements do not really help, zinc and the others. In the outpatient, there's been a lot of development and there are a lot of things. The monoclonal antibodies in particular, they are good at preventing death. And uh, there's good data concerning some of them, which uh, they are not available back home, but they are things which if we are able to prevent disease in the first place, we'll not need all of this. So there's still the controversy behind ivermectin, which is still, cortisin still has a lot of controversy and some antipsychiatric medication, vitamin D has been shown to prevent severe disease, but does not cure once you already have COVID. So it's important for us to know that. And uh, we've had some other new drugs that are being tested down the line. So it's important to know that we do have vaccines. People need to be educated. People need to take them. There are some side effects that have popped up concerning endocarditis and myocarditis in in kids who have had this and the number of cases, the CDC is monitoring them, but the advantage of getting the vaccine still outweighs the disadvantage. And uh, so it's important, there is empiric data showing that taking vaccination, taking the COVID vaccine reduces the rate of uh, infection and also slows down the pandemic and stops the pandemic. So I just wanna thank you all for coming to the town hall for us to have a wonderful discussion concerning customer service in Cameroon. So over to you, Alison. Thank you, Dr. Muno. So I see a question in the chat. Uh, I'm just not sure. The, the name associated with the question is uh, P-A-H-E-S-N. And it reads, has any country attained herd immunity via vaccination? So I don't know if you would want to comment. I don't think, not yet, because the um, Schissel Island, they're not, not country has reached uh, 75%. I think Brian also will be able to tell us from the last data I saw, no country has reached 75 or 80% yet, but the Schissels had reached about 71%. Uh, but the controversy within it is that they got the Ciano Pharma and the Ciano uh, Vax 
more and AstraZeneca, which are one of the least effic efficacious uh, vaccines that we do have, but they actually do prevent severe disease. So they have had some breakthrough cases. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely correct. The, no, no country has really hit that herd uh, immunity threshold. And, and that herd immunity threshold is really based on the reproductive number. It depends on how transmission is reoccurring in the other countries. But uh, Iceland, I think it's at 77%. Uh, Canada is pretty well advanced, I think, in the 70s as well. Uh, the US is around 53 as of today. Um, Cameroon, we are still very low. I think in Cameroon, we are less than 5% or something like that. So we still have a lot of uh, work to do. And we, we still don't know what the role of the uh, Delta variant and what the implications for you know the different kinds of vaccines and what that means in the long term. Okay. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Muno. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I think we'll dive into the main topic for today. So our focus today is to look at uh, customer care in healthcare facilities in Cameroon and the impact that this has on health-seeking behavior. And as you probably will be wondering, oh, we, you don't see any face on the poster or any uh, bios for today. And this is because this session is going to be moderated by, uh, coordinated by the moderators and it's going to be a highly engaging session. So we look forward to hearing your views. We look forward to you know, very engaging discussions. And please know that for the purpose of this town hall, there are no right or wrong views. Feel free to express yourself and you know, make your voice heard. Maybe just as an introduction, I think a lot of times in, in healthcare facilities, when patients come to us, what we see in front of us are just patients, okay? We see someone who is unwell, uh, needing um, help, needing support, needing treatment, needing care. And for some reason, we at times forget that in as much as this person is unwell and comes as a patient, this person is also a client uh, to the healthcare facility in which we work and deserves to receive uh, optimal client care. So some of these, these things are, are usually you know, neglected, but it's very important. And the reason I say it's important is when patients are treated, you, the healthcare provider, what you perceive as being the best thing for the patients, at the end of the day, might not even be what the patient appreciated the most about being in your healthcare facility. So this whole concept of perceived quality of care, it really varies a lot. And those are some of the issues we're going to be touching on today. Elvis, I don't know if you want to chime in. Yes, Alison, you are very correct. And I think that we are looking at this from a very uh, broad uh, perspective. And uh, sometimes when we talk about um, customer service, we only think about a client who is coming to give you money, uh, maybe in exchange for some good. Of course, that would be the same definition because those who come into the hospital, they also pay bills. And it's based on that bill that the hospital has been run. And so they are also customers and deserve the best of customer care. And if the, the usual slogan that call, the customer is the king, we also expect that to be the same story in the hospital setting. And uh, we, 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 we get to understand that in our setting, most of the times when patients move into the healthcare facility, like into the hospital, they relinquish a lot of their powers because they already feel that uh, that power has been absorbed by the healthcare provider who is instead the king. And so we want to look at all that and see what is happening and try to, in this conversation, answer the question, where is the problem coming from? We want to be able to identify where the problem is coming from so we can be able to see how we can approach possible solution. So we want to have a very broad conversation, looking at it from the aspect of a training, looking at it from the aspect of human behavior, looking at it from the aspect of power dynamics. We just want to have an engaging conversation and please, feel free to speak because there is no subject expert uh, here. There's no subject matter expert here. We just want to be able to consider that each and every one of us involved in healthcare in one way or the other might have participated in treating a patient or taking care of a patient in a hospital, be it in Cameroon or elsewhere. And we want to be able to relate to the conversation and say what the experience has been. And I really, I will insist again that uh, we had this experience from our brother, a medical doctor who told us that when he was sick 
as a sickle cell patient, he felt like not going to the hospital. Why? Because each time he was in the hospital, his pain, each time he cried of pain, at some point in time, they thought he was pretending. And the way they treated him was really not good. And so it was an, like an open nerve being touched each, each time he's in the hospital. Rather, you expect to be treated with some uh, you know, human uh, dignity when you are in the hospital because first you are not going there for leisure, you are going there because you are in pain, because you are not well. So it's going to be an engaging conversation and maybe why, Christelle, do you share the same opinion about this topic? So Christelle did notify us that she's in transit. Okay. Probably the reason why uh, I see there's a question in the chat about the French tra translation. Unfortunately, Christelle is in transit. But um, uh, Dr. Mami, we could try to maybe uh, just answer some of the questions that you might have to so just bear with us. Okay. Maybe I will just start by asking, Brian, you are a clinician and you probably have been both a patient and a doctor. You know, you've, you've had the chance to view or to access healthcare or interact with the health system from both uh, angles. So that of a patient probably and that, that of a clinician. Do you have any comments, any thoughts? What was your experience as a patient? Yeah, I, th I think that the, the, there's uh, we, we we have a um, we, we we do have a lot. Uh, I think our priorities have been different. We, we do have a lot. Just had a privilege of being um, be, being a practicing physician in Cameroon and uh, having had the opportunity to, um, to 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 be in the U.S. and see how uh, that's being done as well. And there's great discrepancy in how uh, you know health seeking behaviors and. Uh, uh, customer uh, customer service in general, and uh, just a very big difference in terms of uh, 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 pro provision of healthcare. So I, I think uh, the the so we do have a lot. Uh, I think in Cameroon, and not only in Cameroon, in Africa in general, we do have to revisit this conversation around um, uh, the, uh, you know increasing access to, to to healthcare. I think that's probably probably one of the uh, uh, probably one of the greatest restrictions that we have. This conversation around universal health coverage. Um, and, and I know one of the town meetings we we, we discussed about this and um, people not seeking healthcare because of you know some of those limitations and and things like that. But I I, I think it's uh, definitely uh, one of the things uh, definitely one of those uh, factors that that affects the health seeking behaviors that. Uh, we are seeing not only uh, not only in Cameroon but uh, all across the the African uh, continent, but it's very different from uh, here in the United States, where uh, you know completely different kind of system. And I think a really high time for us to 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 revisit uh, to revisit uh, that conversation, the uh, you know discussions around how physicians have been you know compensated and how the healthcare structure is structured and the priorities of our Ministry of Public Health, etc. So I think it's uh, really important. Thanks, Brian. So you've mentioned a few things, some of which include uh, healthcare compensation of the compensation of physicians. So those are some of maybe some of the factors that are related to how physicians might treat their patients. But let's just put that on hold, and I'm going to touch on a few mothers in the in the in the house because uh, the maternity is one area that traditionally people have complained a lot about the poor quality of healthcare services, the maternity and the pediatric wards. So uh, Dr. Raisa Nana, I don't know if you would want to share with us your views. Raisa, are you with us? Okay, maybe while Raisa is still talking. Hi, hi, sorry, my network is not very good, so sometimes it breaks. Uh, okay. So you said I should give my views on so maternal. You, yeah, you had the chance to work in Cameroon. I mean, that I know very well, and you probably had the chance to be a patient as well. And I know as a mother, I don't know if you have any comments with regards to your experience um, health seeking in Cameroon as a patient and then working as a healthcare provider in Cameroon as well, maybe especially with regards to maternal and child health. Um, 
Well, with my, my with regards to maternal and childhood, I've not had a personal experience in you know in Cameroon, but I've had ex an experience just as a patient, just as you know, someone going to the to the hospital to get care. I think that I don't know as a healthcare professional, my views might be a little. I don't know if I should say bias or, you know, tinted because when I go to the hospital or any other place to seek care, I have inside information already. But I feel that for someone who may not have that information, it might be a little bit tricky. And yeah, that's it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to say something specific about... about okay. Yeah, no, we are, we are glad to have your views. So we're trying to see if we can get someone who's had experience in the maternity or in the pediatric wards in Cameroon. So we want to start with maternal and child health. Why don't I take it back to our own moderator, Elvis Dancer? You had some um, of your children I would like to back. say something? Oh, yes, Sandra, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I think the problem I will go and say first is, is, is I would say it's, it's a systemic problem. Taking... Uh, uh, Cameroon, um, we have our behavior. It's not only in the hospital, but everywhere. When you go and you want to buy something or you go to a bank and you ask for a service, the way the, the person responds to you is not, if you go to a bank in the US, the way you, the person will receive you, the reception will receive you, it's not the same. And that is the same behavior people have in the hospital because all of us are Cameroonian and we have this problem of responding to some, 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 uh, someone else's problem or if people is in distress. We, the first thing is not to say, please uh, calm down, have a seat and cool the person. We always act like we want to fight. And if uh, a patient is in distress, when you have a, a woman come and she's in labor, she's in pain. The other thing is that for us, pain is something like it's normal, if I can say like this, because a uh, woman, the, 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 the nurse there will say, you are not the first woman in labor I'm seeing. So just calm down. She will not try to be empathetic with the patient. That is another problem. And uh, uh, something else I will say is that Usually there's uh, this lack of resources from the healthcare worker. And because they can't um, assist the patient with everything the patient needs, they, they become uh, frustrated and they just put also, this will add uh, in the anger against, not it's not really against the patient, but it's against the system, if I can say like that. And uh, they will not be, empathic about, about uh, again the patient. And the patient doesn't also understand that she is in pain and she wants to be to feel better. But if the nurse or the doctor can't give her what she feels, she will just when she came out of it, she will say, I wasn't, I didn't receive the care I need. That is one point I'll just say. Maybe I'll add something there. Yes. Sandra, thank you so much for bringing out those points. Uh, you've talked about some of uh, the possible causes of uh, you know, the, the, the poor customer service that we do receive in the hospital. Uh, you've, you've talked about a lack of resources that might trigger, you know, uh, healthcare workers at times to behave in a way that is not appropriate because they don't define themselves helpless and are unable to attend to the needs of the patient. You've also talked about it being a cultural problem that is endemic uh, in Cameroon across different sectors, not just in the healthcare sector. Maybe in the bar, you want to buy a beer, the salesperson is not very uh, friendly. In the shop, you want to buy something. That, so are we saying this is a, is a problem that is endemic in Cameroon? Do we have a cultural problem of being rude? Or is it that um, people in the healthcare sector are just a segment of the society that have entered into a profession and then, you know, cross-pollinate their uh, bad behavior into the healthcare sector? Or do we think it is unique? This poor customer service is unique. Are there some of those things that are unique with uh, healthcare workers like nurses and doctors? And I think, Alison, you mentioned one of the very interesting uh, uh, sectors in the hospital that everyone most often complains about, and that's the maternity. Uh, sometimes people think midwives have a, a, a culture of being rude. Uh, to, 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 to women in labor. So the question, what we want to be able to identify at the end of this conversation today in the town hall is, why are these healthcare workers acting the way they are acting? We've already identified the issue of lack of resources, cultural problem. Let's 
it could, could we also have an issue about burnout? Like you have a nurse that is attending to, maybe a doctor that is attending to maybe uh, uh, 100 patients a day, and at the time he's on number 70, is there a possibility that his attitude on the number 70th patient can be different from that on the first 10 patients? Could this also be another reason that is uh, causing the bad behavior? And if so, last time we talked about in the last town hall, the issue of the curriculum. Is there any way in our curriculum where, it be it in medical school or in nursing school or in pharmacology or in pharmacy school, is there any way in our curriculum where there is a dedicated course on customer service and how much of importance is placed on this? Um, we have today the town hall, I think uh, Professor Wisonga was here and I know he, one of the things if he is still around that I want to hear from him is sometimes I want to compare periods and moments uh, and to see if there have been some changes across the, uh, uh, the time span. Um, to, uh, you were surely there in the 70s and 80s and 60s uh, and, and you might have witnessed that the attitude of healthcare workers during that moment. And when you look at it 20, 30 years uh, today and you go to the hospital setting, do you think there have been some change in the way healthcare workers behave and could, has society changed people? I don't know if our own prof is here to just give us some highlights on what might have happened across the time span. I saw prof. I think prof might have signed out. Oh, he I know might... he's quite busy lately. Okay. Yes, I think um, I do... he might have signed out. Yeah. Dr. Bernadette. But I you... see Dr. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, great to see everyone. A long time, and um, I appreciate that at least uh, there is one feminine address that when somebody is free, we can always dial in, and uh, I appreciate the people keeping this uh, town hall meeting up. So uh, to every question, as we always say in implementation sciences, context is the key. I just wanted to find out the quintessence of this question so that maybe while I chip in my own opinion, it should. Um, so what was the, what was your thinking while you framed this question for this town hall today? So maybe we can start from there and then it will be easy to, to contribute. Yeah, thank, okay. you, thank you very much, Dr. Bernadette. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we this topic was triggered by the fact that we had a complaint from uh, one of us who had experience of being a sick line in Cameroon. And he said something that was really touching to say that you are sick and you have a sickle cell crisis. And the thought of going to the hospital is even more scary than the crisis it is itself because of the kind of treatment you know, he got each time he went to the hospital. And that reminded us of uh, other comments we've had in the town hall on customer service in the healthcare facilities in Cameroon. And we thought that this is very important because it also affects the health seeking behavior of the population. If people don't feel comfortable going to the hospital, maybe because they fear the attitude of the consulting physician or because they fear the attitude of the nurses or maybe a pregnant woman who prefers to go to a traditional or bed attendant because she fears the attitude of the midwife, then we think this is as important as every other barrier in, that we address as far as barriers of healthcare is concerned. And that's why we thought we could bring this conversation and uh, just you know try to trace where the possible problems could be emanating from and then see how this problem can be addressed. Is that helpful? So it is very helpful because at least it gives context to the question. And uh, what I can say is, I think when I dialed in, somebody was talking and she was talking about the general attitude of how people respond, how, how service donor, how service provider behave in Cameroon generally. So we have a cultural problem. And so, and that is why I said context is important because if the essence is trying to question or how health service in particular, how we communicate within the health sphere can also lead to healing of people, then it makes sense to bring this topic. Why for me the topic was important and why I dialed in was, I have been working uh, uh, at least from my normal job and uh, in the area of, of trying to 
to think of way to empower the um, the digitalization of primary health care. And if we realize many people do not use the primary health care because of various reasons, most of the general hospitals are congested because one, maybe the primary health care sector it is not as clean, it is not well structured, it's not well equipped, and the personnel are not there. So understanding already why why people are not using specific services will also that i'm just talking from my perspective i try to do some due diligence why people are not using the primary health care and the essence was about how communication takes place and why people rush to to, to the general hospital and it comes back to the same thing and so this aspect of communication is something that is key no matter what level and we let us distance ourselves from the health and go back to society because those are also the social determinant of health why people do not take services anywhere is because when you have no choice at times you might go there people might go to maybe a herbalist because the herbalist takes time to ask them what is wrong with them the herbalist does not assume the herbalist use uses the information the people give them to either demonize their families or sell the herbs. So and so it, 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 is, it is a very important question that you people are bringing up today that the town hub is trying to treat today. But I fear that maybe, maybe I don't want to assume, maybe it would have been advised, I would have advised that somebody should have done some sort of, uh, of, of, of presentation to direct the discussion, but open discussion are always good. But at times at the end, it will be difficult to take out learnings from such open discussion because this aspect of, I remember I, I left Cameroon some, some, some couple of years, some decades ago. What my, my, last, my last thing that I, I, I did before leaving was going to Sonel to pay electricity bill. And I bet you, the person abused me for not bringing enough money for change. The bill was around 3,500, I bought 5,000. The person abused me. So this thing of people misusing their power, people not knowing that the, pay, the, the, the customers are the ones that are bringing revenue to the institution. The, the aspect of service management is something that if we want to, 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 to distance it from the whole societal discussion and focus on health, it might be very difficult to treat because it is within our nature that people talk very, very impolitely within Cameroon. With that, uh, I'm done for now. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernadette. And uh, you, you, you strike finally back on one of the suggestions that we had from uh, uh, Sandra that, um, it is a culturally endemic issue that we are generally rude. And I feel very um, uncomfortable um, that this is something that is really generalized to our uh, behavior as a, as, as a people. And that's why it is important for us to talk about it. And uh, we, one of the ways we, we look at this is that each and every one of us might have been a customer in the healthcare facility or you know, the provider, the service provider. And we think that all of us are subject experts. <laughs> we are, you know, we, we, we all are experts in this particular field because each and every one of us has something to, to bring on board. But just to be able to moderate and make sure that we have a, a conversation that at the end of the day, we can be able to uh, think about the way forward, which is one of the objectives of the town hall. It's not just to criticize, it's not just to say what is wrong, but it's also in saying what is wrong, try to look at where did, did we come from with this problem and how can we solve it? And that's why we, we want to be able to get open views and conversation around the subject. And I, I will call names in the town hall, if you don't mind. Um, um, I mean, randomly, we <laughs> don't feel embarrassed. You can uh, say anything you want to as far as this topic is concerned. I wanted to, first of all, ask uh, um, uh, Crispo, before you left for Japan, you had practice in, in Cameroon. And uh, when you think about the moment when you were in the hospital, do, do, do you think that what you saw as far as customer service is concerned between you and your colleague and just be transparent was 
commendable? And if not, at your own level, where did you think the problem was emanating from? Do we have Crispo? Then Kenji, I think you're, 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 I can see Kenji naturally on, on our screen. Maybe he wants to take it from there. Kenji, you have practiced both as a, as a lecturer and also uh, in the hospital setting. What can you say was your experience and where do you think the problem of customer service is, com is, is coming from as far as healthcare facilities are concerned? Yeah, thank you so much, Evis. I think I'll agree with the rest of the speakers that uh, this is something that is embedded in us. It's not only at the level of the healthcare facilities. Uh, I remember when I was in UB, at that time, they used to have express union where you go to receive your money. That's my money that my dad has sent. Then for me to receive my money is as if I'm begging them to give me my money. They will shout at you. They will yell at you. They will say all nonsense to you. Just for you, you are coming to get your money. And it's because of their money that they have a salary. It is so ironical, it is so frustrating, it is so demoralizing at times that this thing has gone so deep in our society that you know we can't really uh, segregate healthcare from the rest. But I must say that as healthcare professionals, we have a professional ethics to uphold. Even though the bankers can do some things like that, I think for us healthcare professionals, we are dealing with the life of somebody. Now, it's not as if money is not life for somebody, but at least the 5,000 francs that my dad sent to me in UB, I could have still survived without it. But this is a lady, you know, that is coming uh, for, uh, and is having labor pain, is coming to the hospital. Let's not fail to understand that we'll talk of health is not all about biological, psychological trauma as well, constitute poor health. So you come to the hospital, you are sick with malaria, then you end up being sick psychologically again, because the doctor or the nurse or the lab scientist is yelling at you just because they cannot pick a bed. There are people that fear the needle, naturally. So there's one thing that we really fail to include in our practice, being empathetic. I really want us to home in on the healthcare sector because as I said, we are dealing with the lives of individuals. It's not like there in the general market where everybody's there, you know, lumps up and they are doing everything that they want to do. But I do think that most importantly, uh, incorporating ethics in our training is very, very important. Health ethics should not be something that you only do. I only did it at level one. I think it was like a one credit course and that was it. Health ethics and customer service should be something that it is incorporated into our curriculum from level one to level two to level three to level four. This is something that we should, they should continue to talk to us about during the training. And even when we go into the field, this is something that, you know, we only organize seminars to talk about new treatment algorithm for malaria, new treatment algorithm for HIV. Have you ever heard a seminar being organized for healthcare providers just on ethics or just maintaining patient confidentiality and all the like? So I really think that it is high time, right, even at the level of the education or at the level of coming out with seminars for us to start incorporating things like this, specifically for the healthcare uh, uh, community. Of course, we may not be able to target everything in the society. We may not be able to target the bankers, but I think us as healthcare professionals, we hold that ethics to somebody who is coming to the hospital, who is coming sick, somebody who has an accident, somebody who is coming to deliver, somebody who has malaria. These people are sick, but what we do is, we end up making them more sick. At least if I go to Western Union or to Express Union to take my money, I will not become poor. They can treat me the way they are treating me, but at the tail end, they'll give my money, which is sufficient. But in the hospital, I go with a biological illness, then I become more sick because you've made me psychologically sick. I think I'll just uh, end for now with my contribution. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kenji. Um, we have Sharon in the house, Sharon Bachan, who would love to share her experience about giving birth in Cameroon. The reason we've been talking about maternal and childhood is because the maternity is one area where we have very interesting stories coming from there. Sharon, please, would you want to tell us how your experience was and what you think went well and what you think could be worked upon? 
Hello, thank you very much, Alison, for giving me the floor. It's um, it's a pleasure being amongst you know many. I know many people here, and I'm happy to share my experience as well. Well, um, with regards to delivery and that's giving birth here in Cameroon, it's to be candid. If actually, if you can't afford. For most people, if you can't afford going to tertiary, you know, health sectors, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to find the kind of care, the kind of empathy you need from healthcare personnel. Excuse me if I'm touching a very sensitive subject in regards to this. Why am I saying this? Um, well, for, for example, in my case, for my first delivery, um, I'm the kind of person who, when I go to seek for, you know, a health service, um, irrespective of who I am, even if I'm in the health sector, I will hardly and you'll never see me really present myself because I want, you know, that objective, you know, when I go for a consultation, I want it to be objective, not subjective, because I know she's in the medical field and, you know, I wait till the end. So for my first, my first child, um, it was, it was a very funny experience. I didn't know what labor pain was all about. All I knew was how women express themselves during delivery, I had seen it. And to know how it felt, it's different. It's, it, I mean, it's very different. So during the labor pain and all the syntocinon that put on me and everything. So, I mean, the labor pain started hitting different. So I was always complaining and the nurses were like, a doctor or si tu pleure. And that ached me so much. The command doctor, command, um, command you pleur comme ça là. It ached me so much up to the point where my mother was like, why will you say that dog is not a human She's not a human being to feel pain. You get, is she not a human being to feel that pain? Why we say it doesn't hurt her that, how, it doesn't hurt her. So we say don't, like she really expressed, she was really, you know, angry that she, this is the first time she's experiencing this pain. I know the normal saying within um, amongst house um, midwives, excuse me, that same um, pas, um, pourquoi pleure comme ça là? Yes, same premier pas. The reason more for which you need to accompany her during that labor pain, so she feels very much, you know, or not, or I don't know that, you know, accompanied, thought of, well taken care of during that pain, and I mean. That's why you see many people will go, like you say, will prefer maybe to give birth in the house. And I don't want to take us back down memory lane to maybe one of the experience, very gruesome experiences we saw with a lady, you know, uh, in La, La Cantini, for example. You never know what is in the back of their minds. So in all of this, just that statement the, that midwife made, made me very cross and you know, put myself again in these other lazy shoes who can't even afford you know, going to this, and this was a big hospital, excuse me to say, but I wouldn't, you know, disclose the name, but going to this, to, to you know, going to other uh, primary healthcare sectors and what they could be said, if I work with said to them and what, how they feel and what they would find in the long run. Like Dr. Kenji just said, you go to seek for physical pain, but you leave psychologically traumatized. And that is something that we really on that look in, in, in our healthcare sectors. I feel that it's very important. First of all, it's something you need to be born with. It's something I need to groom. Even if you're born with, you need to groom it at every time. Like putting yourself in another person's shoes. How is this person, how am I going to feel if I was in this position? How am I going to feel, not only in the healthcare sector, every where I'll give you a simple, another simple experience in a, another very well-known bank where I went and I was very angry. Like everybody wakes up disgruntled. You say good morning, it's like, the, you say bonjour. You insist again, you say bonjour. And the person is like, it's case obligé de répondre. Like seriously, you're saying good morning. And you simple, just say good morning too. It's as simple as that. I mean, it's everything. And I think if we keep, like Dr. Kenji said, it's something we need to, you know, um, uh, um, um, insist and even organize seminars on ethics and patient confidentiality. And I think that's the only way we can, in the long run, it may not be immediate, in the long run, we can be able to curb, you know, this very brutal way, I'll say that, of receiving or of providing healthcare. Just a handful, 
of people or in the big hospitals where if a patient complains because he knows he brings in a lot of money, he's paid in a lot of money, who will complain? And some directors of those hospitals will take them very seriously. I know of a very good hospital to where you cannot, you cannot dare, like the patient is always right. Like the way the client is always right. The patient, irrespective of your response, even if you said no, you explained rightly to the patient, just the fact that the pressure patient's ego was hurt or you dare do anything in the maternity. I know of a director who will call and suspend you and your, I mean, suspension without salary and you come back and that brings you to set your senses. So there's the other aspect of burnout, which um, Elvis to mention, which is a very important aspect because, and I think that this burnout is because um, given that the, that's the, the, the salary may not be sufficient, not may not be, it's not sufficient, it's not okay. People tend to look for other jobs to be able to compensate their monthly or their daily, you know, um, provisions. And so that care in that it, it's very limited. You won't, you won't stay throughout in that hospital, in that public health care sector, and you run to the um, private health care sector where you'll be receiving maybe one or two, you know, um, um, Cameroon and um, France CFA, 1,000 or 2,000 extra. And that's where, you know, because they pay you better, because they understand and you give your services that way. So there's that transfer. It's not, it's not your, your behavior towards your patients are not uniform. So the salary comes in, the burnout issue comes in. And, you know, with also a lot of exodus going on, it's, it's not easy also in this se sector. If these aspects are not improved on, and this asp um, the aspects of, um, you know, provision salary and all one not, not being provided for, for this healthcare personnel, and also a lot of training on the, on the aspect of ethics and patient confidentiality, we will move on. And if it comes into play, it will take a while for us to get to you know, the best possible level. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon, for this very, very interesting uh, experience you've shared with us. I can imagine how you felt uh, you know, being taken as a doctor who is not supposed to feel pain. That, that is really uh, terrible. And, and I just wanted to, uh, it's just a follow-up question. You said that um, people can be groomed to be empathetic, and I took that down because it's really important. Uh, you, you might not be born with empathy, uh, but you can be groomed to be empathetic. So uh, the first thing is, do you think that if uh, with continuous education of, our health, of healthcare workers on the importance of uh, ethics and customer service, do you think this can lead to some kind of a significant change in the way nurses behave or doctors behave or do you think the cultural aspect that is endemic in them that we are generally root people overrides any kind of training that might be given to improve on empathy that's the first question and the second question i want to ask is uh, if this nurse or this midwife knew that there is audit and feedback policy in that institution where upon exit you are asked to give your impression of the kind of care you receive and score her on a score of 10. And that whatever score you give will impact the way she will be treated by their administration in terms of uh, scoring, grading, or compensation. Do you think she would have treated you uh, differently if this kind of audit and feedback system was enforced? Um, thank you very much for those questions. Um, <laughs> okay. For the first question um, with regards to um, um, training and becoming how to be on how, how if training can actually reduce this, I think so. It may not be it may not be um, 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 completely just that as, that aspect, but I think training that's a continuous training and the continuous you know no being insisted. I will take our current minister of health for example from just from his random visits to hospitals, which are not very much appreciated by the health personnel, but it's somehow good at times. You know, just his random visits makes you wonder that, okay, I mean, people, meaning that something can happen at any time. Just him being, you know, he's gone to, even during the COVID, this COVID-19 sampling for, for travelers, he's gone to, he's gone as a traveler himself and just watched the way, I mean, the um, health personnel were being treated. I mean, I mean, sorry, the, the, the customers were being treated. 
and actually had commented that everybody is working well, but for one person. So, I mean, we are all uh, we are adults. If you're working and you're earning a salary, you're an adult. And in that sense, for example, you don't need to be watched to be able to carry out your duties perfectly. I will keep saying this, this is, and to me, it stays. How do you want to be treated if you were in this situation? It goes, it's just the same as the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love yourself very much, you do everything for your neck, your neighbor to feel at ease, to feel comfortable. And not only should this training be done, but I think the other aspects that may, I, they are, I wouldn't say secondary, but will play a very important role with regards to offering um, 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 financial comfort to these people, uh, um, to, to this health personnel, offering also like relaxation or, I mean, to relax the mind, psychological stress, to re, I mean, ease people from psychological stress is very important. All of these things are important. They all play, so it's not only, the aspect of training. It's also looking at the person that this helps with each and everyone's environment and seeing what can be improved on. Generally, in the case of our public health sector, that should be should come from hierarchy to see how our sector is, what is lacking, what is what is not going right, and offer these services and make sure. In, and also that comes into play for the second for the second question you asked. If this nurse knew that she was going to be, I mean, an audit was going to go through, she would have behaved very, in fact, she wouldn't have behaved the way she was, she did, sorry. I think so. Mm -hmm. Why am I saying this? Because like I said, people like being followed up and which is not right. I think it's all, um, which is not right in the sense and it's okay in another sense because you always need that, you know, that reports to know whether things are going on and well, but you don't need everybody to tell you what you're supposed to do to offer your neighbor comfort, to offer this client comfort. No, the thing, the only thing I'll keep saying, and that if I'm being put into train or it's just for you to put yourself in your neighbor's shoes, how would I like to be treated? If I were in this man's shoe, how would I, if I was a person who had a road traffic accident today, how would I like to be treated? If I had, if I was the person who was on this labor, this, this labor bed, how would I like to be treated? If I was a person who had this daughter here in this situation, how would I like to be treated? Because everybody needs love. Everybody needs love. Nobody can say, no, I don't need your love. I don't need, no, no, everybody needs that love and everybody needs to be listened to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon, for I mean answering this question very intelligently and tactfully too. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, you you said it. Everybody likes to show love, to be shown love, and they, they they always say that people really don't care how much you know. They just want to know how much you care. And sometimes just showing how much you care is very important to us. And uh, uh, sometimes when I when I talk on phone to uh, people here in the US, maybe to a bank or to you know, any other service where I'm seeking to, to be helped, I always get at the end of it, the person will say, thank you very much. Is there anything I can do for you? And when I say, no, it's okay, there'll be a little survey if you want to say how you were treated. And so they know that there is going to be some audit and they are forced to treat me nicely. And, and, and I always say this, if you have your business and you tell you want to recruit nurses and doctors, you don't want to care what their personal attitudes are, but you have a policy. You must be empathetic in my facility. If you are not an empathetic person in your real normal life, that's not an, an issue. But you have an obligation to be empathetic once you agree to work here as a nurse or a doctor, because that is a policy you have to show empathy. Even if it's a fake empathy, that's not a problem if that's going to make my patient comfortable, but you have to be empathetic. You have to treat them nice, even if that's not your natural behavior. So that's why we think that as you also agreed that audit and feedback would have helped the nurse to treat you better. And I think that that is another mechanism in which we can continuously make sure that we put some watchdog to make sure that healthcare workers actually are empathetic, even if they don't like to be. And I think Ajay, Dr. Ajay Rogers is with us today. Uh, Dr. Doctor, you work uh, in HIV research, you are a trusted authority in that area, and you work with so many hospitals. And you know, uh, these are patients that require a lot of confidentiality. 
and uh, how they are treated in each healthcare facility determine how much they will seek healthcare and how much they will adhere to their um, uh, uh, treatment regimen, considering that some of them have to go for their antiretroviral refill in different hospitals. Do you, what can you say about customer service when it comes to very sensitive illnesses like HIV and how these patients react to not being treated well in healthcare facility? Do you think in any way that can impact their adherence to care, which is one of the areas which you are working hard to, to improve in Cameroon, adherence to HIV treatment? Thank you very much, uh, Elvis, for this opportunity and uh, uh, my greetings to you all, and especially to uh, Dr. Former. I think he would recognize me. We were together in, the, in Yaoundé some years ago. So uh, I think it's a, it's a very, very important topic, and uh, I would like to thank the town hall for bringing, up, for bringing this up. And uh, satisfaction with healthcare services is definitely one of the strongest determinants of accessibility to the services. Uh, if patients are not satisfied with the services they are getting from the facility, it's very, very uh, likely that they will not solicit services even when they need the services. And uh, this is particularly applicable with, uh, in, in the context of HIV. As uh, Elvis Riley said, it's a very sensitive issue around and uh, we are very particular about ethics and confidentiality when it comes to uh, people living with HIV. And uh, I'll just say that this, if this topic even coincides. This very month of July, we have the uh, International AIDS Conference. And uh, um, I happen to be one of the presenters and uh, I'm presenting on ethical issues surrounding the uh, HIV diagnosis in Cameroon. And uh, why did I come up with this? We had instances where people were diagnosed, people were diagnosed for HIV without uh, their consent. Like when they know up since 2016, I think there was a lot of miscommunication and uh, many practitioners thought they could just go ahead to do an HIV test without, uh, without due respect of the ethical principles, without respecting the person's autonomy and uh, mem even the justice. So uh, a lot of these accidents occurred and uh, it led to some very, very disastrous outcomes. So I had, a, I, I, I had some case studies of such uh, cases which I, I reported, I, I reported through an abstract and that's what I'll be presenting. But just to say that uh, it's a very, very big concern and uh, I will join you all to say that uh, we need to do a lot in, in, in terms of reinforcing ethics, ethics, ethics. I think that's the crucial part because um, us, the health personnel, we forget to know that um, if we're doctors or nurses, we're just there to save the patients and the patients will save all their rights and uh, we must respect them. We must give them all due respect. On the other hand too, I think there has to be a lot of public information. The users of health services should understand their rights. They should know that they can take down the doctor, they can take down the nurse. I think uh, we take a lot, of, we take advantage. I'm talking to as a health professional. We take advantage of patients because when they come, we, we look like this, the small gods and the patients that they look so low down there and uh, we can tell them any trash, we can do anything. And uh, sometimes they don't even know, they don't even know that uh, there's a lot they can do to put us in order. So I think part of what we need to do is to give the power to the patients. The patient needs to understand that right. They need to be, promote, they, they need to be encouraged to report and take necessary actions. The state needs to take necessary actions against malpractice. And I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, I think uh, overall, whenever we have issues that has to do with, uh, with the society, it's, it's always very complicated and uh, the factors are too many. We've listed many, but I think uh, one strong factor is uh, leadership. And I think the political system definitely drives this. What you find in the health system, you find in any other place, any other sector. Some of us have mentioned instances where the rights were abused. You go to a public place, you go, I'll talk about Sonia even. I've also had a similar experience with Sonia office. Sometimes I will see, I have a regular bill of 10,000 francs per month. In a month, I will see 50,000. They'll give me a bill of 50,000 and I'll go there to find out what is happening. They say I have to pay first before complaining. And nobody has time for you. And there's nothing you can do. They have monopoly and they have 
So the whole, I think it's all about this. Also, this leadership that allows laissez-faire, there's no accountability, people abuse power and all those. Any system that is not regulated is bound to be characterized by disorder. So I think the health system of Cameroon is just a victim of a whole setup that is due to poor leadership. And uh, unfortunately, there are these aspects that needs to be handled right from up, up there. So uh, thanks very much, Evie. I said, I think that's the little I have to contribute. Yeah, thanks. Thank I, I just uh, really wanted to uh, say, I uh, appreciate uh, Aja Rogers. I, I don't know if you're referring to Dr. Mono, but we, we also worked together a few years back. And uh, I don't know you are still the director of the uh, the director of research at the, I think is the Adam Central D. Africans. Yeah, I, I think it's a Central African International Database for Epidemiology or something like that. So it was really, it's really glad to have you and we really look forward to having you more in this uh, this town hall meeting. I was just wondering if in the, among the, the, the large databases that you manage for the Central African region, if you've had any, uh, if you've seen any, if you have any database that includes uh, customer seeking behaviors in, you know, in the African region or anything like that. Like that, do you have any, or have you come across any, or managing any? Uh, thanks very much, Brian. I think it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, I remember. I remember you so well, and uh, um, I'm happy to meet you again on this platform. Um, but I did not get the last part of your question so well. I think my network has been uh, a little bit shaky. If you just go back to it, the last part. Yeah, I, I know you manage a uh, lot of uh, database in, uh, especially for the Central African region. So I, I don't know, that was what, what uh, when you were, what, we, what, we worked together a few years back. So I, I know you were, you had, but I was wondering if you, you are in, uh, you have some uh, databases that looks into this health seeking behavior in Africa in general, if there, there are some specific patterns that we are observing that uh, you need to be uh, to the Central African region or in, in Cameroon in general, if you had any insight on that. Or... Okay, thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that's very pertinent. Well, I don't have uh, access or we, it is not part of our mandate to look at uh, general access or all these other issues, but, uh, but look, just looking at the HIV cohort and uh, just for Cameroon, we have a cohort of about 15,000 that we are following up and uh, a lot of things happen. And, uh, but I can assure you that one of the main reasons why people will not adhere, one of the main reasons why people will not retain is because of the quality of services. There is a, there's a direct link between how the patients feel treated or how they are treated uh, and whether or not they will stay in care. So, uh, and uh, there's this stigma, this, this, there's this issue of stigma, which is highly perpetrated even by the health system. Can you imagine stigma is perpetrated by the health system? And that's really what pushed me to, uh, to write this, uh, write the paper which I will be presenting. Just, it's something we observe and we, sometimes you have to go into the details. I just realized that the policy starts with the health system and it persists in the health system because they're not held accountable. The doctor or the nurse thinks that they can do anything and then no one is going to hold them accountable. And even if the regional delegate has to do something, I have taken upon myself, the I've reported many practitioners but even when I report to the director, the director will try to do something that sometimes the doctor or the nurse have some connections up there. Maybe the, it's connected with the regional delegate or so. So at the end of the day, that's why I concluded by saying that it appears the problem is right up there. Actually, that's my own perception of a problem and not just Cameroon, but I've also observed this in some other African countries, especially Central African countries, but it's completely different. You go to Rwanda, it's a completely different story. And uh, I attribute what happens to to Rwanda to the leadership, but when you go to the HIV cohorts in Rwanda, it's wonderful. It's completely different. People are so accountable. The health personnel, everybody is. Things are just different, and that's why I still think that is more of an up issue. We have to start from up there. Someone has to make people accountable yeah. in all the sectors. Thank you very much, uh, Rogers, and uh, I'm really happy you uh, you will still stay on for another question. You you mentioned something very important, and this is about power dynamics in the healthcare facility. Uh, I had the opportunity to work on uh, a conference for on maternal health that was organized here at Columbia University, and uh, one of the professors here, Professor Lynn Friedman, is working very interested on the issue of power dynamics. And I got to learn that even the way our healthcare facilities are constructed has to do has some effect on 
power dynamics and how much of power patients have to relinquish when they get into the healthcare facility. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, doctors and nurses have the superiority over patients such that when they enter into the uh, healthcare facility, they <coughs> their power entirely. You can imagine even a deal or a big person or once he enter a healthcare facility, he, he just relinquishes all those powers and is now at the mercy of the healthcare professionals. And you mentioned that if power is given back to the patients, this can actually change the way they are perceived and the way they are being treated. And my, my question is, what do you think are some of the ways in which we can give back power to the patients? First, um, patients need to know their rights. So there's a lot about patient education and the, them understanding that it is their right to receive the best kind of care and that it is their right you know, to be treated fairly in the healthcare facility. Uh, I understand that also patients have the right to report somebody and that if they report, they want to be sure that something has been done. What other name and shame kind of process can we put in place to restore back power to patients such that we can change this power dynamics in the hospital facility? Okay, thanks, Elvis. I think uh, you've already mentioned one of the key points. One of the key points is the educating the patients. Patients should know their rights. Most, most patients still do not know that they have the right to report the doctor or the nurse. They still know they still feel that they are so vulnerable, and uh, so we start by by educating them. If they know their rights and if they know what to do, it starts from there. But uh, it doesn't end there because that would just be like you give someone authority and you don't give the person the means to to exercise the authority. So uh, it has to go beyond that. Uh, the our we have to create uh, we have to create uh, platforms. We have to create um, systems which uh, which favors um, update um, that's transmission of such reports. So they, they, in every hospital, I think the patient should know that they can report this and this person and how to do that. There should be a, there should be, there should be a way. Maybe I will take, I'll just take for example, what about uh, a hospital where they have a system? I mean, they have a service for, uh, to, for, for patient, uh, maybe I will say patient satisfaction or a service that is, ha is has some sort of autonomy and there is not directly under the leadership of a director, but that's a service that can, can have, is there to get feedback from patients and then act accordingly. That's just an example, but I'm just talking about a, way, a means by which the patients can actually express themselves, express their dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction without uh, any bias and uh, in a way that the information will go to the right quarters. The information has to go to the right person who has who has to take the decisions? Thank you very much. I think it will be interesting for each hospital to have, a, 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 I mean, a bill of right that is handed to the patient upon arrival. I mean, in some of those major hospitals, because I mean, we see that happen in some hospitals where before you enter, you are given a little paper that states your right, just reminds you of your right as you enter into that facility. It's called your bill of right as a patient. Even if it's not given to you in a print, it could be given to you just by word of mouth. And that we could have some people in each hospital or health center that are just there to ensure and oversee that patients get the best of uh, treatment and satisfaction from seeking healthcare in those services. These are just basic things that can be done. Because as I said, we want to leave here with some kind of few little recommendations on what can change. If you can just change it in just one health center, there could be a ripple effect in other healthcare facilities. So it's important for us to take notes of some of the recommendations. And I think Louisa, you had some thoughts which you wanted to share as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elvis. And thank you everyone who has really already said almost everything that is on my mind. Um, like we all know, this is really a really very sensitive topic and uh, I really have to watch what I say because it's recorded and it's live on Facebook. Uh, but I'm going to agree with everything that has already been said, especially the last part that we just mentioned about leadership. Uh, to me, one of the things that affects the way physicians and other healthcare workers behave or their attitudes towards providing care is where they find themselves. Uh, a lot of times they don't have control over, especially in the public sector, 
where they are going to provide care. So at the end of school, we all submit our documents in Yawundi and we are sent out across the country and people go to places they don't want to go, right? So uh, I think that alone, like the stress of being where you are far from home um, in a village that you don't want to be there, it, it kind of triggers this very terrible attitude that physicians or other healthcare providers will have. It'll be like, I didn't even have to be here, if not for you people, or if not for your government, you know, they're not doing it because they really want to do it. And this takes me to the point of decentralizing um, healthcare. Let it be that each health district or each health area, no, I'll say health district, um, employs their own workers. Like if it's possible that the government could do that and let it come from the district so that people take the initiative to apply to work in that area and write a motivation letter explaining why they really want to stay there and work there. I think it will also do contribute. It's not like the only thing that was going to do the work, but it contribute to um, good healthcare services. Also uh, going back to regularizing and auditing. I think that if patient had a place where they could put a feedback, say someone creates a Facebook page and say, okay, we're going to be putting feedbacks for doctors here. And after your consultation, you're going to write, oh, I saw Dr. Guiza and she was so great. Uh, I'll recommend you see her again. I think having such, um, having such platforms where they can give feedbacks and it's open, like open that anybody can see it. Even if nobody is going to do anything about it, it does a great job and people are going to work hard uh, towards providing better healthcare. And also just to add um, a little bit about regul regulatory bodies. I think uh, Dr. Osric just asked like who is in charge of um, any reports or any malpractice that of course in Cameroon. I don't think that for my seven years in medical school, like I probably heard a couple of uh, doctors being sanctioned, but it's not like very regular. What if we had a system where at the end of each year, a doctor will receive a report um, regarding, or a nurse will receive a report from, let's say the district medical officer or the medical or the chief medical officer saying, this is how you, you behaved or this is how well you did keep up or having a system where we have to give, um, uh, recognize people who are working hard, who are keeping up with, uh, with ethics, who are being confidential and, you know, just that feedback or um, process where you can actually recognize someone's hard work. I think it also contributes. And last but not the least, really, if people know that someone is watching them, uh, if they know that they have to be accountable to someone, they are going to do something. So if we have a health system where we are all going to respect our leaders, and it's not going to be like, oh, my father is the one who owns this hospital, I can do whatever I like. Uh, let it be that we have people we are answerable to, people that we fear, uh, they, if the nurses have like a nursing or uh, Cameroonian Nurses Association that they know that, okay, it's going to bring out my name and it's going to be on the newspaper, I think people will behave differently. Uh, if the laboratories and technicians or scientists have Cameroonian laboratory technicians at the central level that is going to sound your name out, I think people will behave differently. So it all goes back to having a good leadership, uh, having people who are open to giving feed feedback and just letting people really choose where they want to practice. I think that alone contributes a lot, like not choosing where someone goes, but letting them willingly go and apply to practice in that particular area. That's all I have for now, thank you. I think, thank you very much, uh, Louisa. I mean, you, you, you've you raised very interesting points and I, I know why you smiled before you said the point on decentralization, I'm sure, because you know that a lot of things have not been decentralized yet. And I think the least will be the thinking that they want to decentralize health system when even the other uh, political discourse on decentralization is still um, something that has a long way to go, but it's a very interesting point uh, that we could decentralize the healthcare system such that people actually choose where they want to work and uh, uh, maybe write motivation letters to, we will get there someday. It's a very good point and we aspire that 
uh, things will never remain the way they are. And you said something which I caught my attention, uh, another system of naming and shaming people who behave poorly and that there could be a public space, uh, be it a Facebook group or we can make use of technology and social media and have a kind of a social plat a public platform where people can actually go to complain, to name and shame um, you know, those who treated them badly or poorly in the healthcare sector. This could be a good idea if only it is not void of other kinds of biases and personal indignations that can come from people who just want to discredit other people. But I think it's always good when people know that their actions can be reported and that what they do can affect the way people think about them and uh, that can actually change behavior. And that's why um, as the conversation we had with Sharon, we, we, we agreed that if the nurse knew that there was kind of audit and feedback in the facility, she'll behave differently because she knows that uh, there is a report that will be handed at the end as far as uh, her behavior is concerned. You also talk about the importance of recognition and reward. Yes, we are talking about the bad ones. What do we do with those who are good? What do we do with those who are very nice? Those who treat patients very warmly and uh, who, who empathize with their patient? What is being done to them? So some another system that also help is recognition and a reward of those who are doing good. Yeah, because if we focus only on those who are doing bad and how to punish them, then we have to also think about how to reward those who are behaving well. And that's another way to make things better. So I, I really agree with some of the, with all the points that you've mentioned, uh, Louisa. Thanks so much for your contribution. And I think uh, we had Chris Paul, whose hands was up. I know we called him earlier when he was not yet uh, connected, but I don't know if Chris Paul, you want to come in uh, right now. And Carl. Yeah. Yes, good. Come in before I uh, read the comments which Carl mentioned, which was a very important uh, point. Chris, well, over to you. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, I just um, had like some open-ended questions and comments rather. Uh, I would first of all start by saying, um, I don't know why it looks like not everyone, but I don't know, 90% of everyone in Cameroon is angry for some some reason. I'm not sure why, but why is everyone there angry? I mean, I know we do not have like um, money, people are broke, but everyone seems angry at every door, everywhere. Everyone just seems angry. I don't know, is it that Cameroonians are generally angry? Because everyone just always frowning at every service you want to go there. Meeting someone in that office and the person came in at 11 o'clock and tells you like, oh, I'm suddenly going for a break and you greet them twice and it's a problem because you're trying to greet them twice. Why is everyone angry? That's the first thing. About ethics in our health systems, I remember scanty lectures with um, the then Dr. AC, who's professor now, who was regarded as, you know, one um, white lady who has, um, you know, trimmed her hair and she doesn't really give a damn about anyone. That's how she was regarded and people never really follow up what she was saying. Meanwhile, from toiling around these countries, I've seen that what she was actually doing was way, way, way important. And we, we do not really consider that at all. The, 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 the next thing I, I, I want to know is that why are some people generally, when they have a health problem, you know, they just start fretting because they know they don't have finances. And given that we don't have any kind of um, insurance health system, people turn to generally afraid about every situation they will have. And, and we have about, I'll say three categories of people when they come to our health um, you know, structures. There are people who brush because they have someone in authority and they think that, oh, okay, as they have someone in authority who can defend them, then generally, you know, they can just be rude and arrogant and it's okay to be that way. Um, Sharon rightly said, um, healthcare personnel are literally paid 
to an extent, I would say, you know, chicken change. Well, let's say groundnut change in, 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 in our health system. I mean, it's a reality. We are poor, but then again, it, it's a central problem. It's not just with the health system, but it's some kind of general problem. But then again, burnout. When people are burned out and then someone comes and brushes and just talk to y'all anyhow, you feel, first of all, angry. Again, the problem of anger comes in. People just get angry. And that's why you see people fighting in our health systems. People take out knives and machetes and they want to butcher other people. It still comes down to why are people angry? Um, and then people who actually brush because oh, they're in position of responsibility. They're actually wealthy for the level of the country. So they feel like, oh, they can buy the healthcare services. And even those who are offering the healthcare services, it looks like I schooled in Yaoundé just to personally take care of their child who just has a problem in the tummy. Meanwhile, I have someone who has an open fracture and is bleeding and I need to save them first. I need to prioritize them. But because the other person is a wealthy, rich person, well, I need to attain to their daughter first. I remember working in PMI and I had this situation and I had to put my balls on the line and be like, this deal, I'm not gonna see you and you will follow the queue. If you don't want it, you're very free to go to another hospital. And immediately my boss was called, the regional delegate at the time was called, and then I received a call and they were like, yo, you're still young. You're just from school. You don't respect authority. I said, I respect patient care. That's what I'm trained for. I'm not an administrator. And it was really a problem. And I was like, whatever, I did what was right for me at least. And, and so these are some of the questions I'm trying to understand. Why is it that some people really um, think that they're, um, you know, people in position of authority who are supposed to help maintain a system and make that people follow the queue, they, you know, decide from the queue and then they want to show that, oh, their authority and their power controls you and the system and it's them. So you should serve them and leave someone who is at emergency because they are there at that point in time. And they tell you how they're supposed to do. And sometimes we do the same thing. Like we go to a service, we just want to skip the queue because we're doctors. So systemic. But then the, the, many, the most important thing I want to understand is why is everyone back home angry? Thank you, well, Alice. Thanks, Crispo, for those comments. Um, I think it's actually a nice way to dive into the last part of this conversation. Usually they say it takes two to tango. And so far we've been looking at how um, some of, a lot of us healthcare providers are not giving the best to our patients. But I believe that there have been times when uh, the patient's experience itself was not you know, agreeable because of the patient's behavior. So in this case, the problem is not the healthcare provider, but rather the patient. And, and it's interesting, Chris, you mentioned cases of patients who've come and they're expecting everybody to roll the carpet for them just because they're in positions of authority. I want to call on Dr. Wingo. Dr. Wingo, hi. Hi, Alison. Yes, Dr. Wingo, so good to have you. I want to put you on the spot on the, with this question because um, we believe you, as you are one of our senior colleagues who has a lot of patients. So it will probably take a lot for someone to get, for a patient to get you, you know, on your nerves. Have you had situations where patients have outrightly behaved very inappropriately and, you know, this could have impacted the way you attend to them or impacted their experience in the, health, in the hospital? Yes, 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 yes. Alison, I think um, with all the years of uh, practice that I've had, it would be difficult in our setting to say, no, you haven't had a very bad experience with a, with a patient. And I have had a couple of them. I think that it, it happened once that a patient actually went physical on me and actually had to, to pull my, my lab jacket. Lucky it was very strong and it didn't get torn. But when I read the situation afterwards, I came to realize that it wasn't actually the patient who was very offended. Sometimes the carers that come with the patients are another set of people that we need to pay a lot of attention to because they are 
they are not sick and definitely they have all the powers that they need to make a lot of noise around. And therefore, when coming to the health facilities, they have a lot of expectations. They don't give a damn about the weaknesses of our system. All they know is that when they come here, we expect this, we expect this, and we expect this. And therefore, just like Elvis was saying, people need to know what they should expect when they are coming to a health facility. And therefore, that initial communication with them in an appropriately set up patient uh, customer service or in an appropriately set up reception service would help them to know what they can get and probably what they cannot get. And that will help them to calm down a bit. Now, our system is very weak. And I have to say that that is where the problem all starts. We must know that we are not working under the normal conditions. We don't follow any norm. When you consult 50 patients in a day, that's crazy. That's not how doctors were meant to consult patients. You can't do that with a smile all the time. You can't even have a break because by the time you are leaving your office to go on a break, I bet you, you even you're gonna have a bite or gonna eat something, you won't have the appetite because just the words you get when you're leaving your office, they can actually switch off your appetite, which makes you now you want to stay back and offer service to a multitude of people. The patient doctor ratio, when we look at it, it says it all. It's not easy to have a very good experience. It's not easy for the patients who come to our facilities to have a good um, experience. And therefore we, de we barely struggle to do what we can, but we know that we would never be able to satisfy our clients to the best of their own expectations. So that is what I think I can say. And for the patient, for the patients who come very sick, we should be very careful with the carers that accompany them. That is what I'm going to try to chip in so that we should not only focus on the patient herself, but we should look at the people who come with them, who are not sick, and who are those who are going to constitute quite a difficult uh, group to handle. That's what I can say for now. Thank you, Dr. Ringo. And I would, I would shift it back to Dr. F uh, Muno, Muno Forma, because we usually when we hear about you know, patients or caregivers who are nasty, we think, oh, it's just a Cameroon situation. But we have senior colleagues who've practiced either here in the US or in Europe or in other like more developed settings who have probably had this kind of nasty experiences as well. Uh, Dr. Former. Well, Alison, thank you. And uh, I think it's a wonderful discussion we're having here, reflecting on customer services. And uh, I think humans as a whole have a tendency to want to get good outcomes wherever they may be, even in Cameroon or in the US. And uh, once you find yourself in a place where there is a lack of accountability, we are men generally to be, to move into a state of entropy, not a state of organization. So you need people to be checked and balanced. You need rules and regulation to make people do things the right way. People don't just do things the right way, the way you think life is supposed to go. So looking at this topic in the US, I've been also approached several times by hungry patients. The problem here is that my reactions are going to be punishable by the code of ethics, the way I react. In those situations, back home, maybe no, even the patient's reaction is going to be punished because it's not a must that the patient's reaction is going to be taken into account. And uh, you do have cameras at times everywhere that can see certain things. Other times you have eye weaknesses. So you need to stay professional in those situations. It happens everywhere. People get angry. People lost loved ones, which mean a million to them. People love loved ones who are taking care of hundreds of people that are actually dependent on them for a life line. And this means a lot when they're in the hospital. To you, it could just be a patient, but to the family, it's a breadwinner to about a hundred people. And this means a lot to them each time they're in the hospital. So coming into the hospital, we need to make sure that our hospital systems, I'm gonna look at it as a hospital systems. Here we have, a lack of protocols, where we have protocols in place in order to address certain situations. 
we should also be able to have the leadership like Rwanda, as Sharon said, and it's a pleasure having her here. So even uh, Rogers, I'm happy to see both of, I'm happy to see a lot of people I've known throughout my career and uh, either we work together or, so like leadership is one thing which you cannot, um, how do I put it? You cannot ignore in the current situation in Cameroon. Leadership is everything. Policies can start from bottom top, but difficult. You need everyone to change their mindset. Top bottom is very important at times for a good leader to give a direction to people to follow. We lack leaders. We lack leaders at the top, at the, at the top of where things are supposed to change. There are some few of them who have come up and we have seen certain changes that they can bring. There is financial burden to the patient and also to the workers that we're dealing with. Here in the US, as let's say an oncologist, even you make me so angry at times, the person's gonna be like, okay, I make 500,000 US dollars, okay, I'm good. That's different. So guy has, can stomach anything that comes from the patient. But this guy back home is unable to feed his family when he goes back home after listening to all these grunting patients that come in. They are patients, you have to be patient with them. But you are unable to be patient with them because you're just human. You're not well compensated. So there is a financial burden to, the, to both the nurses, the laboratory technicians, the, 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 nur the nursing aides, the physicians, and everyone who is working with these patients, they are unable to actually care for themselves. So they tend to use means that are not acceptable in order for them to get money. And whom do they extort? They extort patients. And these patients come into a healthcare system where there is no universal healthcare. And uh, initially they are asked to provide 5,000 francs for a blood transfusion to be given to a loved one who is bleeding, to go bring three donors, which they don't know where they're gonna get those donors. So they find themselves in a very stressful condition when their loved one is already dying and gives them the tendency to become aggressive the physician who is going in to do a cesarean section, who is not going to be compensated anyway for it, doesn't find the motivation to even go do it. The next thing is more about accountability. In every system where you have accountability, you will uh, be able to check people's egos and you'll be able to check people's vices, the way people behave. All of us, we are not intrinsically good. <laughs> Neither are we intrinsically bad. We are not born to be racist. We learn those things like being intrinsic. You're not intrinsic. The same doctors you complain about in Cameroon are the same doctors who are practicing here. No one has heard anything about them. Same thing. And I will give you that. No, same thing. Same laboratory technicians we're dealing with in Cameroon are the same PhD holders here in the US topping the whole chart, topping everywhere. And they're the same people. So in a place where there is no accountability, what happens? There is chaos. There is a free chaotic market that reigns in the hospital where everyone wants to become rich by the means they can because the government is not compensating them adequately. A few people in the country are making all the money and retaining the money. The issue of justice, meaning that if there could be justice in such a way that I, the plaintiff, I, the patient, can take a doctor to court. I can sue the hospital and win. I can actually go in and prove that things are done wrongly to my patients if there's going to be a big difference. And there is also the lack of, um, how do I call it, more of patient consent. Patients do not really have the, the, the feel, as everyone has said, it, the moment they move into to the hospital, they give out, they, they give they give away all their rights, all their the the doctor becomes the king, and the, they are like the uh, subordinates, the peasants. Let me put it that way, in the pyramid even. So they are even unable to even do anything. So they don't even find a way which they can actually cry out loud against a system that is not working for them. There is also infrastructure frustration coming in inaccurate diagnosis from doctors, multiple diagnoses 
from different people telling you you have different things because they just don't have the instruments to even diagnose people well. There is lack of training, as uh, Dr. Kenji said, lack of training and lack of training in things that are important, medical ethics. Just reflecting about ethics, we don't reflect about it. We think that practice ethics is something that you just inherently are going to be good. Humans are not inherently good. You need law and order to make them good. There is also unnecessary treatments that patients get in hospitals and they tend to realize it after a while. Like this guy kept giving me the same thing and I'm not feeling fine. So they come in already angry. There is unsafe facilities that are available. You have hospitals that do not even have a structure. Women delivering in areas that are not even well constructed. They don't even have water, clean water, hygiene and sanitation. Why do you want these people to be happy when they even go there? They know internally that they are aggressive because the system itself has made them to be aggressive. So there is lack of so many things we need to be able. First of all, I want to start understand these things, but I think there is a way going forward from here, meaning going forward in the sense that we need to talk about this and reflect about this and be able to find solutions. To complain is easy, as I said. I have had patients being aggressive here in the US too. I've had patients saying they don't want treatment from a black guy, which I worked out. I have had situations where, but majority of the patients know that their actions, they're accountable to their actions. I know that my action have to be accountable to them. Whatever I do, there is freedom and responsibility, You're not just freedom. It's not because I have the right to move with a gun that I'm gonna walk around and shoot people. There is freedom and there is responsibility. So if we do know that, I think things will be different. But I don't think the human beings are different in both areas, no. I think they are the same humans, but the system where they find themselves, many stressors and factors make them just so completely different. Alison, I'm, uh, I will stop here because there's so much I can say about this topic. Uh, thank you, Doug. So I think as we reflect now um, on potential solutions, you've actually touched on a few. I don't know, Elvis, you see, um, we have a bit in our basket. Yes. So trainings came up first, and then we've had issues around doing audits and giving feedback. Elvis, I don't know, maybe just continue about some of the other solutions that you picked up. Yeah, thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to come back to Chris Post. Ask uh, question, why are we angry? Uh, there was a time I was guest on CRTV and I was talking about the happiness index of a country and how that is calculated and what that impacts every other sector in the country. I was in, it was a very interesting conversation on CRTV. I remember that moment after that, I had a lot of calls asking, what do you mean by the happiness index of a country? And I, I, I had so many indicators that you can use to measure how much people are happy or sad in a country and how that affects the way they behave. And Chris Paul, the, the, the answer to your question is just that, Sanevapa, right? So <laughs> a lot of people just say Sanevapa, you know, it's not working. And when you want to complain about the healthcare sector, you realize something else is not working. You want to complain about educational sector, you, you realize that the transport sector is not working. You want to talk about access to healthcare, you remember that the infrastructure, road infrastructures are not there. You want to talk about banking system, you realize that connectivity is not even there. So everything is interwoven and that's why at every point there is some trigger. There is always a trigger that uh, occurs before someone's uh, ego is touched and then for that person to react either in a positive or in a perceived positive manner or negative manner. So the question is, what are those triggers? And we have all in this session identified those triggers. We've identified the triggers being maybe poor payments of uh, healthcare workers with power dynamics. We've identified the triggers being burned out from so many consultations of that doctors have per day. We've identified all those triggers and that this could also be the triggers that are causing healthcare workers to behave the way they are behaving. We've also identified the 
those triggers that can also cause the patients to behave the way they behaved. And thank you, Wingo, for actually recognizing that sometimes even the carers of those patients are a problem. And the question is how much access should we allow carers to have when they bring their patients to the hospital? How much of access do they have to influence you know, the kind of care that is being given to their patients? So I just wrote down some recommendations. Alison, if you don't mind me to go through it so it can add to what you captured. We said that Sharon reminded us that we can actually groom people to be empathetic. And this is very important. This can be done through regular training and education. And uh, there is need to, to put in a public, uh, uh, I mean, a kind of an audit system of where we have feedback uh, from workers individually each time we are leaving a facility and where, uh, you know, this feedback can be used to reward or punish uh, those uh, personnel. And if they already are aware that this is in, in, in place and is being enforced, that can actually influence their behavior and the way they treat patients. We also said there could be a public space uh, where, I mean, this, this came from Riza, there could be a public space where we can like name and shame people uh, publicly. And uh, if everyone knows that there is a, an account on Facebook or somewhere where I don't want to see my name there as a doctor because I treated a patient poorly, Maybe that could uh, influence their behavior, but uh, we also have to be sure about how much access people have and how that can influence those who want to use it for negative purposes. We said there is need to know that we are not working under normal conditions in Cameroon. And some of those abnormal conditions might be the triggers to the way people behave the way they do. And that the financial burden uh, on our healthcare workers tend to influence the way they react to patients. And so if you think that you are going to consult 50 patients, you are tired, you don't have appetite like Dr. Wingo said, but you go back home and you are still unable to put food on the table adequately or for your kids to go to good school despite all the sacrifice, then as a human being, that could be a trigger that will cause you to behave in an abnormal way. And so we think that the issue of healthcare compensation could be revisited to, as a way to make sure that the happiness index of healthcare workers is improved. So that as Mona said, if you insult me and I know I'm going home with a good pay package, I might take your insult as nothing. But if you insult me and add it to my low paycheck, that, that is just like touching an open nerve. So another thing could be uh, a good justice system where plaintiff who are in this case patients can be sure that if they sue a doctor or a healthcare facility, they can have a fair judgment from the judge and that any uh, decision taken can actually be implemented because we know in Cameroon, if you sue somebody, you need to drag in court for, for years before you get a verdict. And just the thought of going to court every moment can dissuade you from suing somebody, even if you have all the rights to do so. And uh, we also talk about training, like Kenji mentioned, there is no adequate training uh, of our healthcare workers when it comes to customer service and ethics. And our curriculum needs to be uh, revisited so that we emphasize the importance of uh, ethics as part of our curriculum and to see that you know, there is continuous education and that people are, seminars are organized and people can actually understand that it is important and primordial for us as healthcare professionals to provide the best quality of care to our patients. So Alison, these are the few that I was able to capture as uh, some of the possible solutions that we discussed today in the town hall. Thank you, Elvis. Um, Bernadette, I see your hand is up. I don't know if it's um, up like now or it, if it's... Um, okay, now it's down. Okay, I think at this point we can start winding down. Yes. Alison. Yebo, yes. I just, I just wanted to equally find out if um, the fact that patients go to where they are necessarily not supposed to go to, could equally constitute another area that needs to be fixed. Because you find a patient who has probably a flu, finding themselves in a regional hospital, a referral level hospital. Meanwhile, the health centers are empty. I think that in the organizational setups of hospitals, there should actually be a service that can determine if you should be here or you should not be here. Because I think it's a bunch of those cases of flu, simple malaria, that find themselves in very high level hospitals that constitute the nuisance. So 
we should equally think of arranging our hospital in such a way that we don't just admit any kind of person in the hospital. At least we should learn to let people know that there are health centers by the corner that could actually take care of such simple cases. And I think doctors will concentrate more on the difficult cases and take their time to do a diagnosis rather than being pestered up by people who have skin rashes and disturbing doctors from concentrating on patients who need care. Thank you. Uh, that's a great point, Dr. Ringo. Yes, Elvis, please go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Ringo. You know, Dr. Always, Ringo's point, like he always moves us. <laughs> from the point, uh, really a great point, Dr. Wingo. And uh, I was thinking um, in a system where healthcare is paid by insurance, where you have gatekeepers in the he uh, insurance health system, you can be sure that um, this can easily be regulated. But in a system like Cameroon, where 94% of payments for healthcare is out of pocket payment, and we also know that um, he who calls the piper, he who pays the piper calls a tune and my pocket determines where I go to. Um, will you think that um, if I go to the general hospital with my money and I want to see um, Dr. Wingo who is consulting there and I insist that I want Dr. Wingo to consult me, all I will spend is time and resources to see Dr. Wingo, but I don't think that somebody will tell me, you know what, you cannot see him because he consult, he does not consult people with flu, you have to go down to the health center. It can be a very good system, but for out-of-pocket payment, Dr. Wingo, do you see that this can be possible? Yeah, I agree with you that in a system like, uh, like us, it will be very difficult to do that kind of regulation. And more to that, um, the PBF reform, the performance-based financial reform has come and even made things very bad because uh, the number of patients seen in a hospital definitely is an indicator that brings them more money. So it will be difficult. I just put it in perspective, definitely, so that in the best of worlds, we could actually make our patients know that you don't just see a doctor anytime you want to, but you see a doctor for a reason and for a particular purpose that he needs to attend to. But if they do so, really, we will have uh, hospitals with lesser patients and maybe we might gain more in our happiness index. So I put it in perspective, Elvis, and I agree with you totally. Yeah, Wingo, I have a question usually. When this comes up, the question I have is, as doctors, if we are sick, are we going to take our patients to those healthcare centers? Meaning we're dealing with a situation where it's good enough, there's a pyramid of health. Question you ask yourself, if I'm sick today, am I gonna to go to the health centers that I want these people to go to? Are they equipped enough, do they have the resource enough to take one of that flu? If the answer is yes, good and fine. But most of the time to me, the answer will be no. So it goes back to investing and it goes back to putting healthcare as a priority. And it goes back to accountability, even of those who are investing money back home, who take hundreds of millions in order to invest them in health centers and do not build them and don't build them appropriately and don't sustain them. And that's why these people don't, I lived in Mancon, you know that very well, where I worked in Mancon where there was a healthcare center, which was the CMR, which had no water. How should a woman go and deliver there? Why should she not go to the regional hospital? Where there, there was no water, there's no running water. She's also going to be scared. Her child, how is her child going to be treated? What kind of water will be used to bathe the child when the child is born? These are big issues we have back home. How will she not even be angry? Even delivery there was a thousand francs, and delivery in the regional hospital, as I know it very well, was five thousand francs before you get the key. She would prefer that she loves her child. She wants the child to be alive. She doesn't want the child to be delivered and have sepsis. So. These things, I know we are bringing them up. They are very good, Wingo. I love that. I really want to go to the healthcare center. I don't know if I am sick, I'm going to go there. But there are times I may go there if you're there. Who knows? But it's very important that we tend to see that these patients don't go there also because we are dealing with a complex problem. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Mono. And there is, when I look at this, I try to look at the pull and push factors. There is a pull factor and there is a push factor here. And there is something that is pulling them to the regional hospital. And there is something that is pushing them away from 
the health system from the health center and we want to be able to see exactly what are some of those things and there is a concentration of health workers healthcare workers in some of the facilities more than some you find in one facility a lot of doctors a lot of nurses and in just in the same city in the same um, within the same geography there is a health center that is having no medical doctor at all and so this kind of uh, you know, staffing situation also creates the push factor that send people away from the periphery where they were otherwise supposed to get this primary health uh, care that they need before going to tertiary health care. But one thing I take from Dr. Wingo, which is important, is just the fact that patient education of understanding the healthcare pyramid and where they need to go to for some kind of things is important. And if they can go to the health center and their problem is that they are not well treated there before they go to the, horse, to the hospital, that would be at least their own justification. But not knowing that they have to go to the health center when they are sick of basic things is where there will be a problem. And I agree with Wingo that there is need for that education as well to, or to, in me to, I mean, just to depopulate those, some of those uh, regional hospitals that are already so populated. So Alison, we are already at uh, three o'clock, uh, two hours into the conversation. Um, it's been really great and I really appreciate all those who have uh, spoken and great points and mm. I think this is not a topic where you can hope that in a two hours conversation we can solve Cameroon's problem. First of all, any issue that has to do with emotions, emotions don't go to school, right? People will be angry when something is not correct and they'll be happy when something is correct. You don't need a PhD or any degree to be happy or sad. It's just inherent the triggers and so it's something we have to continuously have this conversation and see how we can address them bit by bit oh yes Elvis no thanks for wrapping this up so nicely and uh, ladies and gentlemen I think at this point uh, we are rounding up with the town hall for today thank you all for your interventions thank you for being present uh, it's been an exciting discussion and we hope that, you know, we all take away some key lessons uh, which we, we should be implementing in our daily practice as we go back to our healthcare facilities to see our patients. Remember to be empathetic, remember to keep ethics at the back of your mind. For those of us who have leadership positions, maybe we could consider um, organizing trainings for our healthcare providers, as well as conducting audits and giving feedback to people working within our settings and giving the patients the chance to truly really express themselves, you know, when they hit these challenges. The aim is really not to, you know, point fingers or labeling, but really to help improve the overall experience that the patients and the healthcare providers would have at the end of the day. So I think at this point, I will just hand over to our chairman to give a vote of thanks, and then we can close our town hall for today. Wow. So I just want to say it's been wonderful talking about this topic, and uh, I just want to thank all the moderators for the excellent job. And please, in the town hall, if you have interesting subject matters you want us to talk about, let us know. The town hall belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to us. So it's really our voice to the Cameroonian people, our voice to the public, and our voice for change. Before you implement any change, you must talk about it. Then you must start thinking about how to implement it. So I'm very grateful always having you here. And please own the town hall. If there are things you want us to talk about, if you feel you are qualified to let us know or educate us or bring up a subject matter that is important for Cameroon's health and uh, for Cameroon to move forward or for the healthcare workers to benefit from, don't hesitate. The forum actually is open to every single person. And uh, you can always contact Brian, Alison, Louisa, myself, Christelle or Elvis, any one of us, if we don't respond, you can just contact the next person, please. I know we have busy schedules, but please, this is your town hall. If it was not Thank left you. on you guys, I would have run away long ago. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at this point, we're going to close uh, the town hall for today. And please keep an eye out for the next town hall. We have a powerful team 
joining us during our next town hall is going to be exciting. So we already know what's going to happen. I'm so excited about it. Unfortunately, I can't spill the, you know, spill it out right now, but just watch out for the next flyer. It's going to be an exciting presentation and we have a powerful team that will be joining us. On this note, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your weekend and stay well.